So I'm Philip King, and I'm the leader of the Muon Group at ISIS. So we're, we're standing on top of the proton beam. It's going under our feet, even as we, as we speak. Proton beam from the ISIS accelerator goes down, and where the sort of pipe work is down there, that's the neutron target. But about 20 meters upstream, just where the sort of blue pointy things are, that's where we have a muon target. We're, we're sneaky here. We take uh, a few percent of the proton protons that, that, that come from the accelerator, and the few percent of the protons that get taken by our target produce muons. And it's a thin piece of carbon that we stick into the proton beam. Most of the protons go straight through it and onto the neutron target. But our, our bit of carbon, the, the, the collisions that the protons make with the carbon, produce muons, and then we use those muons and we feed them to some experimental areas. So we're going to go a little bit closer to the, uh, to the muon target. So here we are. The muon target is just here. And what happens is we have our, our piece of carbon and the, the protons hit that. And actually, the first thing that they do is they actually produce pions. Pions are a little bit, they're, they're particularly exotic. They're really weird. They only live for 26,000 millionths of a second. So they're kind of gone in a real blink of an eye. Um, but when they do go in the blink of an eye, they produce muons. And that's the thing that we're actually interested in. And um, uh, muons themselves, as they are, are an exotic particle, they, they also actually are short-lived. They only live for two millionths of a second. But actually, two millionths of a second is ages. And in that two millionths of a second, we, we can look at exactly what they do inside a sample. I can take you down and show you a bit more about that. So what we've got there is the actual split of the muon beam line into three. You've got some blue magnets there that are, that are bending the beam around the corner. So now uh, we're standing by one of the muon instruments, and we've got three of them on this side at ISIS. And the muons are, are coming in, and they're coming into the middle of this, uh, this, this big green thing. And the big green thing is, is actually a very big magnet, because sometimes when we do muon experiments, we want to put uh, a strong magnetic field onto our sample. But what you can see is the big magnet. Uh, from the side, there's a, a thing going in from, from the side, and the sample's on the end of that. And that thing is uh, meaning that we can cool the sample down to low temperatures. And then at this end, you can just see the wires coming out that are attached to the detectors. So we've made our muons. They, ca they come out of the, uh, the carbon target. We've, we've uh, sent them round the beam line and into some, some lump of stuff, some material, that uh, we want to know what's going on inside it. We want to know what its atoms are doing, how they're talking, how they're moving, that sort of thing. So, our muons are going in, and I like to think of them as being like little spies. So normally we can't see what the atoms are doing. But if we send in muons, they get a, a muon's eye view of what's happening. They're like spies going into a place that we can't normally get to and telling us what's going on. And uh, muons do that. They'll go in and they'll sit amongst the atoms in the middle of a, a sample, and they'll, they'll get a feel for what the atoms are doing. And as I said, muons, they're exotic because they only live for two millionths of a second. And although that sounds a short time, but actually it's more than enough time for a muon to get a feel for what the atoms are doing. And when the muon dies at the end of its life, it fires out another particle. And we detect those other particles. And the, the detectors that you can see, the wires here, are the detectors. Those particles tell us what the muon was doing kind of like a post-mortem. They tell us what the muon was doing and hence about the atoms. This is the Hi-Fi muon instrument. In fact, you can just see on the red uh, support, it's got the letters Hi-Fi. It um, stands for high field. But we've got three other beam lines. Walk this way and I'll show you uh, wh where they are. This instrument is called uh, MUSR. Which, uh, which stands for its muon spin research, if you like. And um, this was the, the first muon instrument built at ISIS. It produced muons over 20 years ago now, although actually we have upgraded it a bit since then. All the noises that you can hear, you can hear this sort of pulsing that's going on the whole time. And that's, that's about keeping stuff cold. It's about um, fridges and things that are cooling samples down to low temperatures. This is the emu muon instrument. You might just want to pop in a little closer. Uh, 
Emu is um, not about the bird, but it's about uh, it being a European muon instrument. Uh, this was funded by a large grant from Europe, and so we have lots of European researchers that will come and use actually all of the instruments. It's nice that you can actually see them. We don't need lots of shielding around the muon instruments, and so you can actually see the kit, you can see the magnets, you can see the detectors, um, and uh, it does make them an interesting thing to look at. Our sample mounts for muon experiments are normally not hugely exciting, but if you want to look at a liquid, then, uh, then we'll put our, um, our liquid into a, a cell. This is about the size of the muon beam, a couple of centimetres or so across, and uh, in this particular cell you can put a liquid in, fill, fill up this space with, with, with liquid, and fire your muons in, and this is a thin window. Uh, muons don't go through too much stuff, they'll only go through about half a millimetre of stuff. There is a hairdryer. We actually, you might say, why on earth is a hairdryer there? Muon scientists are very uh, concerned about their looks, and so we have a hairdryer. Actually, seriously, we have a hairdryer because often the samples will come out very cold, and uh, before we can touch them and use them, we want to warm them up so, so, so we, can, we can handle them, and we'll use a hairdryer for doing that. What actually is a muon? Muons are the heavy versions of an electron, is what they actually come uh, in terms of how they're classified as particles. So they come in positive and negative varieties, a bit like electrons, and electrons have a positive um, uh, other particle, an antiparticle. Muons are the same. We mainly use positive muons at ISIS. Um, and so they're, they're, sort of the, they're the next particle level up from the electron. So they're exotic because electrons are found in the stuff around us. All the atoms around us have, have protons and neutrons in the nucleus and electrons going around the nucleus. There's no muons in there, so where do muons come from is a very good question. And when our, when our proton beam hits the nucleus of a carbon atom in our target, in the energy of the collision, that's where you get other particles produced. I say muons are exotic, and they are, but actually, they're not so uncommon. In fact, we all get hit by about a muon a second because they're produced by collisions between protons, protons that hit the Earth, high up in the Earth's atmosphere. They come from space, these protons. They hit the atoms at the top of the Earth's atmosphere. And in exactly the same process that we produce muons here at ISIS, those collisions will produce pions that live for a real short time, but the pions decay down to muons. And those muons make it all the way down to ground level, we just make a lot more of them here at ISIS. So we can't use the ones that come from high up. We need them in far bigger quantities than that. Muons are one way of building up a picture of what's going on inside things at the small scale. If we have a, a material that's got an unusual property, maybe it conducts electricity in a new way, maybe it is extra strong, that's great. But actually, if we want to produce more of it or stuff with more of that sort of property, we've got to know what the atoms are doing. And muons are one way of finding out.